Hello, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> so, nice to see you. Um, I think this guy doesn't need uh, an introduction. Yeah, I was here earlier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but not just because of that. I mean, yeah. you're, <laughs> you're a true legend. Do you know that? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks for coming for this uh, fireside chat. Um, today, we want to talk with John about uh, a really interesting project he has right now. So, it's his uh, first uh, book, his first autobiography that will be released when? On July 18th. July 18th. Yeah. It's three days before my birthday. Yeah. Uh, not the best timing, John. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, before we start, like, um, what's the secret to your uh, hairstyle? Asking for a friend. Hair? <laughs> yeah, people have asked that for years, actually. Um, they want to know um, why I still have hair. They want to know how I do my hair. Um, and it's kind of funny, because I, I, uh, I won the genetic lottery, I'd say, because I'm uh, Yaki on one side and Cherokee on the other. So um, my Cher the Cherokee side won <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the hair, hair Olympics, I guess. Um, and then with uh, what I do with my hair is nothing special at all. Okay, yeah, same. <laughs> Don't need to. Same here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same, exactly. Okay, John, um, tell us, um, what what um, motivated you to, to write your autobiography? I mean, you could, ha you could have waited for, you know, another 30 years or... I know, I could have. Um, I can't even remember what made um made us decide to do that my wife is involved uh, also in in the the decision process and actually in writing this as well um i think it just seemed like it was a good time to do it uh there'd been a lot of years since doom and 20 years since masters of doom which is the the book about uh me and john carmack uh came out in 2003 so it's been 20 years since that came out and there's some some stories in that book that just aren't even true, and uh, and so I thought it'd be good to to write, you know, to write a book from my my own words that um, is not like Masters of Doom, which is really polarized characters. John's polarized into a, looking like a total computer, and I'm polarized as like a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> and so this book is kind of um, this book totally like shows what we really were like together working and. Um, how we did stuff, <clears throat> and the great thing is that now you know we can look back at all the decisions we made and the things that we did, and uh, and just kind of go, this is probably why this happened, and we know that we were too young, and you know this is this was a consequence of that, and um, so it's a really good looking back book, and it's also the whole book is pretty positive as well. There's no taking anyone down. There's no like revenge uh, because I don't want to be remembered as the person who said whatever, you know, like. Um, so it's a really positive book. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about positivity. It's not uh, it's not only a positive book, but what I really um, what I really like about you is whenever I watch you know some some conference appearances from you, or when I uh, even in Masters of Doom, uh, when you read the book, um, you did have a pretty um, hard childhood, like in in, in many terms. But uh, you seem like to be a very happy guy, and you seem like you you have enjoyed enjoyed your childhood, and um, and um, so how how did you manage to keep this positive attitude? Because I um, never heard you complain about anything. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's the funny thing is I don't complain about things. Um, it's. Uh, you know, I guess when something happens, you just like, <laughs> it's probably cultural. Um, you just expect the worst. And so when the worst doesn't happen, hey, that's pretty great. Uh, <laughs> um, being able to make games for a living is unreal. So everything on top of that, like everything else is just no big deal. It's like, it's it's pretty great to be able to, to just make, to come up with ideas and make those ideas happen. And you know, who gets to do that all day? Um, so yeah, there's, it would be dumb for me to be uh, negative about having a life where I can just come up with ideas and make things, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty much cool. Yeah, that's that is really really great. Like, what what would you say is the main difference between that autobiography and uh, Masters of Doom? Well, Masters of Doom was written by somebody else. 
<laughs> okay, that's um, obvious. <laughs> yeah, and, and the characters, or our characters in that book were um, the result of a hundred people being interviewed about me and John and what we were like in their eyes. And so that's how our personalities and our characters were created as polarized types. Um, so that was that. That plus some of the stories aren't true in there, but most of the book is totally true, <laughs> um, but told in a in a in a more visceral way. I'd say um, this one, this book is told in a more measured way, and uh, and there's a ton more detail in this book than is in Masters of Doom. It already has a higher page count, and the font and everything is is more is more is is a little tighter, a little smaller. But you know, like there's no pictures in here because. I wanted as much information as I could get. We still cut 30,000 words. Mm. Do you also share technical details? I, I heard something about like there is some some um, some sections where you explain like some 8-bit, 16-bit thing. Yeah, yeah. There's bits. there's some technical stuff in there, but it's not too much. It's it's uh, it's told through. It's 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 not me typing up the technical stuff. It's me explaining the technical stuff and then someone non-technical writing it out. But still, it's like, you know, it's. It's, I think it's just there to, um, to give people, if they have a question, some bit of te te technical stuff, even though it's not really deep, mm. um, at least it's there. I mean, it's, it's funny to, to have a book where my whole life is programming and being super technical and having to write a book that has very non-technical, most of it. <laughs> okay, so also non-techies can actually read it, right? Oh yeah, this is a normal, like, <laughs> it's a good <laughs> book to read. Um, lots of stories in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like one of the, I guess one of the things that that uh, I never even thought about it like this because, like, when things happen, they just kind of happen in a row, and and then it's like bam, 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 and then I did this stuff. But when you, but but when I look back, one of the biz most bizarre things is that uh, when I was 11, I had taught myself how to code at a university on their mainframe. People don't do that. <laughs> Like, they didn't kick me out. They didn't kick out an 11-year-old in the computer lab who's running around asking questions about how to program in basic and then giving me a book to shut me up and uh, and then just spending time trying to write an adventure game and doing that for years. That's just, like, not normal stuff that kids do. You know, they don't, like, stick with it or uh, just being exposed to a mainframe as the first computer as well is just, like, bizarro. Yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about these technical details, um I mean, the first games you did in plain C, and you, I, I would say, you're a big fan of Assembler. And um, I mean, you didn't even use C++ for the early, for, for the early games. Um, do you think that contributed to the success of the, of the games? Was it a factor, or was it just you know, out of fun because you thought it's better? Well, let's see. Um, <laughs> first, C, I started programming in C in 1990, so before 90 was all assembly language and basic. So I did a decade of that. That was a lot of making a lot of stuff in assembly. And then when I could finally program in C, which was great, I actually wanted to program in C before I actually did it, but I was not allowed to at the job, which is another story in here. Um, but when but when we did uh, when it, when we did start programming in C, we didn't use C plus um, plus because we didn't want we we were all about making the computer go as fast as possible. So we needed to know where every cycle was going, and we could see it in our C compilation. We would we would compile our pro code, and then we would disassemble it and look at it and see if we could optimize those instructions. It's like why aren't we why are we doing a pointer calculation for every one of these lines when we could just do it up here and then just like index off of that things like that. Like there's a lot of stuff that we would that we would like we were we were all about assembly even when we were using C, and we didn't use C plus plus because. In C++, if you do a runtime call, you don't have the computer anymore. And that could be who knows how much uh, is going on in the background stealing cycles. So we did no C++. Even even with Quake 1, there was no C++ involved in any of our games. Mm -hmm. I remember you met the inventor of C++ last year in Berlin, right? Bjarne? Yeah. Was it the first time? Bjarne. It was the first time I ever met Bjarne. I mean, so was he, he go to some kind of uh, early kind of uh, idol or some someone you, you looked up? He invented like the most important computer programming language other than C. And you right? still didn't <laughs> use it. <laughs> I know. I know. But but uh, it's funny because if you use C++ now, if we, use, we do use C++, but if, if you do use it, you have to use it in a very limited fashion in games so you do not 
lose control of your of your game's speed. Um, but it was really great getting being able to talk to him because he doesn't do conferences much, and uh, and I luckily I got to spend an entire hour alone with him talking about C++. It was just like the coolest highlight. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Okay, um, let's come back to the book. Um, so it's it's coming out on um, July 18. Yeah, people can pre-order, so you should really do that. And yeah, Romero.com um, is where you would do that if you were going to pre-order it. Perfect. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering, like, people who follow him on social media, they know that uh, you are also an amazing cook. <laughs> do we read something about Mexican uh, uh, food in this book? Jeez. Uh, yeah, there is some parts. I'd have to search for it, though. Yeah. I have three parts that are that are that are set here for different parts of game dev, but I don't have a cooking one. Oh. Um, but I did, like before, like in Masters of Doom, it didn't cover anything before I was 11, but um, before I was 11, I was living in a totally Mexican culture, and I learned how to cook everything at that time, and uh, and I still cook every day. So I and cook you like it spicy? Yeah, like how many of course. Scoville? Of course. How many Scoville? I don't even deal with Scoville. I don't. Okay. I, I don't want to burn my mouth already. off. <laughs> I do not want to burn my habanero is good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> um. I, but I don't like. Uh. I don't like food that's too spicy. That mm. takes away the like. When you're paying attention to the heat, to me that's that's a problem because you're not paying attention to the food. So, I like it as part of the taste, mm. but not where it becomes the p the point. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> have you ever thought about um? Combining your two passions, like cooking and and games, somehow. Well, like we made a game called Gunman Taco Truck, where you make tacos. Oh yeah, <laughs> <true>. <laughs> it's an amazing Gunman name. Gunman Taco Truck. It's a great uh, name. Just imagine it. That's yeah. what that's what you do. Who did the naming conventions like for for all of these games and and whose ideas? Well, it, depen that? it depends. Like the first up until up until id software where i made my own games i was naming all of my games mm. so that was um at least 60 something games wow. you know um that i had made before id and at id it depended on when the game was happening and who was involved in the thought processes so things like commander keen that was mm. tom hall Okay. So Tom Hall was our creative director. He came up with the ideas. He came up with the names. He came up with the enemies and just everything. He's he's a super super creative person. And uh, when Wolfenstein happened, that was me, and that was really because I wanted to make a Wolfenstein, mm. uh, a new version of it. With Doom, that was John Carmack who came up with the name Doom from yeah. Color Money from the cool pool cue. Um, and for Quake, that came from a D and D campaign that we had played. Um, after we had made the first Commander Keen trilogy, we were starting on Quake, and it just wasn't time. So we just kind of put it on ice and waited five years, and then four years, and then we, then we started working on Quake. Um, um, okay. And um, by the way, how how is your relationship with John today? Ah, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah, John and I email nice each other you. once in a while. Unbelievably, like this is pretty funny. Um, Last year, at, uh, I don't remember exactly what, it could have been a year ago, um, Kevin Cloud, who, uh, out of the original id software people, there were four of us that founded the company, and then we brought in two other people um, a couple of years later after we had founded the company and had made a lot of games, but they were still in the very early phase in 1992. They, ca they came on while we're making Wolfenstein, and it was Kevin Cloud and Jay Wilbur, so we kind of count them as the, you know, us six at the very early times. Um, in last year, Kevin Cloud's son was going to RIT in, in New York, and he's doing game, game design, I guess, and so he wanted to, to he talked his teacher into doing, uh, having a talk with people that his dad worked with, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and so Kevin invited me and Tom and John Carmack to a talk with a, just a, a, a group of students a, at a university. So that was four of us out yeah. of the six. Reunion. <laughs> the first time that we had ever talked like that together since 93. Wow. Yeah, because you know, Tom was out of the company mid-93. And so like that never happened after that at that point, except for last year. So we did a whole t uh, hour-long talk 
mostly about the history of id software together to a bunch of students that are like on their phones and bored and, <laughs> and it was like wow this is like really rare to have us together doing this oh that that's a, that's a great story um <laughs> would you like to read some some parts of the book sure yeah yeah let me uh let us have some insights all right let's go for um okay so how many of, of you have read masters of doom all right, not too many people, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but so you should read it. It's really an amazing book with a lot of details. It's fun. It's, it's really, and you can learn something from it. It was good until this book. <laughs> <laughs> but this book is only this coming book is out. even better. Terms. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information here. Um, so when we were, like the reason why we became it is is what I'm gonna kind of read about here. We were working in, a, there was a group that I put together at a company that I was working at. The company was called Softest Publishing, and I wanted to make games all day and not make tools and stuff like that. Um, so I, uh, I put this group together called Gamer's Edge, and I needed people in the group. Uh, I, you know, had never worked together with other people my entire life at that, that po at that point, and because the 80s just wasn't the time for people. People were doing stuff individually in the 80s, so this is 1990, and I need. And I'm like, I'm going to put together a group. This will be really cool. I needed a programmer and I needed an artist, and it was just going to be three of us. So, I got John Carmack. There's a whole story about how I got John Carmack in here, because um, it's. It's a bit of a story, but uh, but I but I got him and he was very excited to join, and I got Adrian Carmack and they're not related at all, and I'd never even heard the last name Carmack when I met them. <laughs> but Adrian was an intern in the next room over, and I brought him over, and uh, and so I got all three of us in the room and we started making a game called Slordax, and Slordax was a was a vertical scrolling game similar to Xevious from 1985, if anyone knows arcade games. It's a top-down shooter uh, where you're dropping bombs on stuff and shooting, you know, bullet hell type enemies in front of you. Anyway, we're going to do that on the PC, and uh, and so we started making that game. And John, I gave John a book that had basically the secrets to all graphics programming in it, if only you could understand it. And uh, and so he he figured out how to make the screen scroll vertically on a PC smooth like an arcade machine, which no one had seen before. It hadn't been done on the PC. Um, so I saw him do that, and that was really great, but it wasn't, to me, it wasn't like the world's world changing, like horizontal scrolling would be, because Mario had changed the world in 1985 when it came out, and if you could scroll the screen horizontally, it's even more difficult than vertical. Yeah, and smoothly. Yeah, smoothly, smoothly scrolling the screen. Um, and uh, anyway, so what happened was John and Tom stayed up late uh, one night after he'd already gotten the vertical scrolling going for Slordax. And he, uh, he got horizontal scrolling working. And he basically put that, they put a disc on my, on my keyboard. So the next day I would come in and go, huh, what's this? And then run it. And so I did, I ran it. And uh, let's see here. Um, so here's here's the the explanation of what happened that day. <laughs> I'll I'll read it. Um, oh, I'm doing. I'm also doing the. Uh, I've finished recording the audio book for this as well. So it's so I'm reading my own book, which is pretty cool. So <laughs> usually get someone up. Will Will Wheaton did Masters of Doom. Did a really good job on it. Um, but people wanted me to read my own book, so I did that. All right, so here it is. Um, I was speechless. I know that may be hard to believe. I talk passionately about games to anyone who listens. Whether it's about programming techniques, upcoming games and consoles, or the latest game I'm into. Softdisk even had a con uh, con uh, what is that? Oh, con conversational atmosphere. Still, on September 20th, 1990, I was at a total loss for words. But my silence wasn't the real story. The reasons for my silence, that was the real story. In the space of about one second, at the age of almost 23, I had glimpsed my future, my colleagues' future, and the future of PC gaming, and that future was phenomenal. 
Moments before lo losing my capacity to utter a single word, I had arrived early to an empty Gamer's Edge office to find a three and a half inch floppy disk on my keyboard with a note from Tom instructing me to run the program on the disk. I inserted the floppy. I was greeted with a brown title screen announcing Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. One side of the screen had a circular portrait of Dangerous Dave, a character I had created a couple of years earlier, in his signature red baseball cap. And the other side had a portrait of a judge bedecked in a powdered wig holding up a gavel. I, <laughs> I took in the image and wondered how Dave was going to interact with the halls of justice. I had no clue where this was going. I hit the space bar and got the shock of my life. A familiar video game lit up my PC screen. I was looking at a replica of Super Mario Brothers 3. The billowing white cloud characters, the green shrubs, It's not scrolling. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the construction blocks and rotating gold coins. But Super Mario didn't exist on the PC because the technology that powered it didn't exist on the PC. It existed only on the Nintendo Entertainment System and a couple of the 80s best computers, the Atari 800 and the Commodore 64. These systems had the custom chips to handle two-dimensional side-scrolling PC games or sorry, side-scrolling. PC games, due to a dearth of graphic support and processing power, had been restricted to static screen games and chunky scrolling until Carmack created smooth vertical scrolling just a few days earlier with Slordax. Now I looked at Super Mario Bros. Mushroom Kingdom and wondered what it was doing on my PC screen. I also noticed Dangerous Dave standing at the bottom of the screen, the character I created two years earlier who was inspired by Super Mario Brothers was now inheriting the Mushroom Kingdom, or in inhabiting the Mushroom Kingdom. I laughed. That was the copyright violation of the title, but how far did this parody go? I hit the arrow key to move Dangerous Dave and find out. What I saw destroyed me. <laughs> the scenery on screen was changing, moving, as Dave walked and bounced his way into the game, moving right. New scenery and new challenges emerged. Everything smooth, uh, scrolled smoothly, seamlessly, continually to the left. I hit the direction keys, moving him back and forth, up and down. As much as it looked like I was playing, I wasn't. I was processing the enormity of what I saw. You know how in Star Wars, when the Millennium Falcon goes into warp speed and the stars start whizzing by? That's how I felt. Teleported into the future. I had to stop and process what I had just witnessed, what Carmack had done. I was sure Tom had done the nuts, nuts and bolts recreation of Super Mario Brothers, its game, uh, Mar Super Mario Brothers 3's gamescape, which was funny and cool, but the horizontal scrolling that knocked me out, that was clearly all Carmack. The two of them had created this little program as a joke, as a fun way to tell me that Carmack had figured out a cool programming trick that he took on my challenge and delivered. Only this wasn't just a cool trick, this was a revolution. For me, the implications of horizontal scrolling were so vast it was hard to fathom. I saw the entire universe of PC gaming expand in that split second. Horizons were no longer finite, no longer limited to the fixed dimensions of a computer screen. I had been immersed in the PC game market for a good two years now. My goal had been to understand every game, all the technology, all the programming tools. I had immersed myself in the PC because I needed to know where the leading edge was. When I saw Dangerous Dave moving effortlessly to the right, I knew the leading edge was right before my eyes. I mean this quite literally. I knew what I witnessed, and I knew this was our future. Ironically, Carmack and Tom didn't. I knew what part of the video hardware Carmack had to use to create the side-scrolling effect, but he had figured out another optimization that reused background graphics so that the PC could read, render, and react with maximum efficiency. Remember that processing power and available memory were a fraction of what's standard today. Carmack had created a rendering engine that rewrote the rules of the game, of all games, and yet he didn't realize it. In fairness, nobody did either. Um, yeah, and the rest of that part, there's me showing it off and people just going, oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah, I mean, and it's actually, I mean, it, it's industry uh, shaping, right? Yeah, it changed everything. I mean, yeah. games that came out after it, 
started sh- smooth scrolling because we actually let some people look at our code yeah. and see how it was and how we actually controlled the screen. Uh, did was, you license it? We licensed the engine. Yeah, we yeah. Licensed, it's it's all in here. We licensed our engine for the very first time. If anyone's wondering about you know Unity and Unreal engines and how they are uh, how they came about uh, with the licensing model, we're the ones who started that in 1991. So we licensed our smooth our horizontal scrolling engines first, and then we moved on to Wolfenstein and Doom and Quake and all that. Oh, that's an incredible story. Um, like you mentioned, this uh, floppy disk. Um, do you still have the original one? Yes, I do. And I have that disc. Okay, and uh, kind of, uh, it, it is like it is like packed and sealed, or is yeah, it yeah. Like you use it? Or? No, I never use it. It's okay, a, it's, so a, it's an artifact now. Okay, okay. <laughs> legendary artifact. So it's probably in like 20, 30, 40 years, maybe we can see it at an auction. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I can't. S- I can't Where say, exactly but at your home we're planning you on doing something with the disc, because it's okay. the beginning of id software and the beginning of 3D games. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, how did you do actually? Like you know, I mean, I'm. Sh- I know it didn't exist back then, but how did you do things like version control? Or <laughs> 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 version control. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, you need to somehow like you know work on the game together. Yeah, oh, yeah, few, yeah. Five of you, six of you. Yeah, so the way we did that, because there was no such thing as version control, um, we all had hard drives. And on each other's hard drive was what we were working on, which was mostly the same, except for the changes that we were making. And uh, and so what we would do is, uh, at the very beginning, it was just me and John programming the game, so it was very simple. There were There was no merging of anything back then. What we did was... John has his files that he modifies as much as he wants, and I got my files. And sometimes we have to modify the header for the game. And so we would say, hey, I'm touching game.h or whatever it was we were going to call it. And then I change it, and then I copy it over to him, and he has it. This is copying it on a floppy and giving it to him before we even had networks. And uh, and then he would copy it. Now he, there's two copies of this thing, and that's great. Because <laughs> um, if, if, if everything, like some someone's... You know, drive died. They would just copy the stuff off everyone else's computer and just put it, put it in the directory, <laughs> and it's all good. You could do a DevOps talk. <laughs> we never, <laughs> we never had a hard drive failure. Wow, that was pretty lucky. Oh, lucky you. Very lucky. <laughs> On that old have changed ho- history. <laughs> uh, yeah, that old hardware, uh, no hard drive crashes ever. Yeah. So, anyone knows like how much time do we still have? Like two minutes or so. Okay, she's waving, so we should kind of close our talk already. Yeah. Um, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, we'll meet each a lot. other in, uh, what is today? One. 22nd yeah. of May, 23rd of May, 24th, I don't know. But we'll meet each other end of July at Real Developers World Congress in yeah. Berlin again. Yeah, that'll be really great. And then the book will already be out. Yeah. And then it will be indeed better than um, Masters of Doom. That's right. <laughs> then it'll be real. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's called Doom Guy: Life in First Person uh, by me, and uh, yeah, it's a fun book. I mean, people had a lot of fun reading Doom uh, or Masters of Doom, and there's already some reviews about this book that are out there, and people really like it. Uh, it you know, my wife did a, a, a great job on it. She's an excellent writer, and uh, she's really she's she's good at tear jerkers. So yeah, that's good. So <laughs> Brenda is uh, is not Brenda. here today. She's not here. She's no. not here. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, and the good thing about these books, you can read it really fast because they are super interesting. You can read it as fast as a squirrel, so yeah. it's really really super interesting. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Good, John. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, a big applause for that legend. Thank you. <laughs> cool. See y'all later. I'll be at a table out there. <laughs>